Go in here. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Alberta Skills monthly webinar. This month we are talking about autonomic dysreflexia and the improvements that have been made in the healthcare protocols. Our professional guest is Dr. Rebecca Sharpenel. She is the spinal cord injury lead at Foothills Medical Center, as well as we have three lived experience guests, uh, guest speakers, Casey, Casey Ayala. Uh, she's the patient liaison for neurosciences at the Foothills Medical Center. Rob uh, McIsaac, he's the client service coordinator for spinal cord injury Alberta, as well as a registered social worker. And we have Ke Keisha Master. I'm always going to ruin her last name, Master Keisha's here. And she's just an all around awesome person. Thank you, Keisha, for showing up and sorry for ruining your name. So just a reminder for everybody, we have the rehab advice line. This is an Alberta only service and it connects callers to all health clinicians around Alberta to help you with things like activities and exercises that will help with physical concerns, uh, strategy, strategies to maintain your day-to-day -day activities, rehabilitation services that are open for in-person or virtual visits, and community-based organizations that can support them. Uh, this service is open seven days a week from 10 to 6 p.m. Uh, disclaimer for this webinar, the information contained is not uh, in the webinar and related materials is not a substitute for professional medical advice. So please come contact your medical practitioner for more information to see what is right for you. As well as this webinar is being recorded and will be made public uh, available later on our YouTube channel. Some housekeeping rules. Everyone will be muted during the uh, presentation. There'll be a short presentation followed by a discussion and everybody's invited to share your views and opinions and questions uh, later. Uh, please feel to turn your camera on at this point. If you wanna participate in the conversation, you can either request to speak in the chat box or wave your hand. Or if you ask questions during the presentation, we will get to them after the presentation. So just know that your questions will be answered. We'll monitor them. Like I just said, we will monitor the chat box for questions and comments if you have any uh, technical issues. There'll be a poll question appearing on your screen at the end of the presentation. Um, so it'll be about a 30 second little question in for you to answer. And you can change your name or you can keep your video off during the webinar. So without further ado, uh, Rebecca Charbonneau, I'll let you take control. Great, thanks, Terry. Um, let's see if I can I advance the slides here. There you go. There we go. Um, yeah, so today's talk is just going to be a short talk on autonomic dysreflexia. And then um, we're also going to hear. Um... Oops, sorry. sorry, that was my fault. Okay. <laughs> Actually, Terry, do you want to just control it? It's not working on this end. Okay. So yeah, well, this slide's fine. Um, yeah, so we'll just start with um, an overview of what autonomic dysreflexia is. And from here on out, I'll probably just say AD because it's a lot shorter, shorter and simpler. Um, we'll talk about you know, what happens to your body during AD episodes, and then also go through the most common causes. So that would be bladder, bowel, and skin, and then highlight some of the additional causes that can cause AD if you've ruled those ones out. And then we'll touch about uh, treatment, uh, review the take home messages, and then we'll hear from persons with lived experiences about um, when they've had AD and um, you know, what, they've, what they've felt, and then also what their um, experience has been uh, with, the, with the healthcare system there as well. And then here are some of the updates that have been going on recently. Um, trying to improve uh, the management of AD. So next slide, please. So I thought I'd highlight AD by going through three different cases and we will come back to these cases later in 
um, the discussion. So the first case is Lucas. So he's been waking up every morning, pretty much at the same time, 4 a.m., drenched in sweat. And he finds that when he turns in bed onto his other side, that the sweating goes away and he can get back to sleep. The next case is Amy. She's been getting goosebumps and a pounding headache every time her caregiver does digital stimulation with her bowel routine. When the program is finished, the headaches are gone. And lastly, Mitch. So he has a headache or he's had a headache, sorry, for the past two days that won't go away, even after taking things like Tylenol or Advil. He's also noticed increase in his spasticity. And last night he had an episode of incontinence. Um, so what do you think could be going wrong in this case? Next slide, please. So those were all examples of autonomic dysreflexia. So as you can see, it can look different for each patient. <clears throat> Essentially, AD can happen um, to anyone who has a spinal cord injury above T6. And you know, this is a this is an emergency situation. So that's why it's important to know about, also important to know how to prevent it and then also treat it if it does happen. When we think about sort of what would have happened before a spinal cord injury. So if you start at the number one, so there's a full bladder. So prior to your injury, your bladder would have sent a signal to the brain. So up the spinal cord to the brain, and it would be a message saying, you know, hey, it's getting kind of full down here. It's probably time to find a bathroom to avoid. Um, and then that signal would go away. So now that the spinal cord is injured, that signal does not get up. So if you fall again, starting with the number one, so the bladder is full or the bowel is too full, a signal gets sent to the spinal cord. It goes up, it tries to get to the brain, but unfortunately because of the injury, that signal is blocked. What the spine does at this point is it sends a signal out to the blood vessels, everything gets constricted or smaller, and this raises the blood pressure. This blood pressure elevation then causes the side effects or the symptoms that you have. So um, headache, flushing of the skin, some blurriness of the vision, uh, goosebumps below the level of injury. It can cause the heart rate to slow down or speed up. Um, and this is all, again, because the brain is unable to get that signal from the brain down the spinal cord um, to the area where um, it wants to get rid of that pain signal. If the blood pressure gets too high or stays too high for too long, this can have serious complications. So things like stroke, seizure, organ damage, um, such as damage in the eyes, brain injury, or even death, which is why, again, we want to be able to prevent this. And then if it does happen, we want to be able to treat it quickly. Um, one other thing about blood pressure is the increase doesn't have to be that high to be considered AD. So by definition, it's only 20 points above your normal pressure. The other thing that most people know after they've had their injury, their normal blood pressure might be 90 on 70 or 100 on 70. So it might be quite low to start. And um, if it rises, say it gets from 100 normal to 120 with AD, um, not all healthcare professionals would know that that um, is a medical emergency. And that's why it's important to know your own baseline blood pressure. So when AD happens, we've talked about some of these already, but just to uh, review the signs and symptoms. So it can be headache, goosebumps, changes in a vision. You can have a feeling of impending doom, anxiety, apprehension. You might get some flushing of the skin or the skin might look a bit splotchy above the level of injury. Which... Um, often people have nasal congestion and then with the heart rate. So classically, it's thought to be slow heart rate, but you can actually get a rapid heart rate as well. I'm looking for it. Next slide, please. And so when we talk about causes, um, we'll go through the three main categories. Um, so that would be bladder, bowel, and skin. 
but there's certainly a lot of other causes to think about if these ones have been ruled out. Next slide, please. So the number one cause by far is bladder. In over 85% of the cases, this is going to be the cause. Um, it could be that the bladder is too full. So if you have an indwelling catheter, perhaps it's been clogged or kinked somewhere along the, along the line, or that catheter babe is just too full. Um, if you're doing in and out caths, then sometimes it's just a signal that there's been incomplete emptying. It could be that there's a bladder infection or a urinary tract infection, um, or that you have a stone like a bladder or a kidney stone. So if we think back to those um, cases in the beginning, the um, individual named Mitch, he had a urinary tract infection. So he was getting spasms, headache, new incontinence. Once the bladder infection was treated with antibiotics, all of these symptoms went away. Next slide, please. The next cause to think about is bowel. So certainly constipation can cause AD, hemorrhoids, um, even having um, gas or infections of the bowel. And if you think back to um, Amy from the beginning, she was getting AD episodes every time she had a bowel routine. So perhaps she needs to talk to her physician about getting a stool softener if she's having constipation or something like a topical lidocaine um, if she um, continues to have AD with each bowel routine. Next slide, please. Skin is the next thing to check. So, um, you know, certainly pressure injuries can cause AD. Something very benign sounding like an ingrown toenail can cause AD. Burns, including sunburns, blisters, tight clothing or shoes or braces. Or if you're accidentally sitting on something that's hard or sharp, um, this can also trigger an AD episode. So it's important to kind of do a full head to toe check. And Lucas is um, the example here where he was not on a turning schedule. So at night he would go to bed, but he was woken up because his body sensed this pain. So even though he wasn't feeling it, it was an indication that he needed to turn. So in the future, um, if he was on a bit more of a, a schedule to turn, um, these 80 episodes would be reduced. Next slide, please. And finally, once you've gone through all the most common causes, it's really important to start looking for other causes. So um, pretty much anything that causes pain can cause AD. So things like gallstones, stomach ulcers, appendicitis, blood clots or DVTs, uh, HO, which is heterotopic ossification, bone where it's not supposed to be can cause AD or even something like a broken bone. Um, and you might not even have, you know, a history of a big trauma. It could be a pretty benign sort of transfer, um, but just make sure you're, you're inspecting things uh, to see if there's any abnormal swelling or bruising. Next slide, please. So as far as treatment, I'm just gonna go over sort of um, the most basic things, but you know, certainly talk to your physician about this if you have more questions. So the first thing to do is sit up. So, you know, a lot of patients are um, lying down or um, you know, even forced to lie down if if sometimes you're in um, a certain medical situation. So yeah, certainly sit up. That helps to reduce the blood pressure, and then check the blood pressure. So it's really important that you have a cuff um, to be able to monitor your own pressure, and then find the cause and resolve it. So sometimes easier said than done, but often start with checking the bladder, make sure the Foley's draining, um, make sure that there's no kinks, or if you're doing in and outs, just do, do an extra cath, check the skin, check the bowels. If you're not able to find the problem and you can't resolve it, then call 911. At this point, it's really important to have an AD wallet card. So healthcare providers might not be experienced with spinal cord injury medicine, and they might not know about AD. So this at least will give them some quick um, access to information. And, you know, certainly you might need to advocate for yourself. Next slide, please. So the things that I want people to take home from this presentation is AD is a medical emergency. So it's something that you know, most people are able to resolve on their own, um, but you need to be mindful of it and know that there's other symptoms um, that might be AD. 
if you start to have AD, especially if it's, um, you know, you weren't before, and now you're having these new episodes, certainly contact your healthcare provider. So when I have patients um, come in for, for clinic visits who've been having AD, it's always really helpful if they have some record of the events. So try, if you can, keep track of your blood pressure, so your baseline, and then what it was during AD, what the symptoms were, what the cause was, and then how you fixed it. And then also, it's really important to have an emergency kit with you. So you want a blood pressure cuff, you want all your supplies you might need for bladder or bowel management. And this includes, you know, when you're at home and then also when you're out and about. Um, and any medications that were ordered by your MD um, to treat AD if, if this is applicable to you. And then lastly, um, just make sure you have your wallet card on you as well. Next slide, please. So yeah, now we'll hear um, uh, from our peers, their stories with autonomic dysreflexia. You're on mute, Terry. No, oh, Terry, you're on mute there. Love Zoom. Yes. So thank you so much, Rebecca. So yeah, we'll now hear from our peers and we'll kind of have a back and forth between uh, our peers and, and Rebecca and talking about their experiences. So I'll uh, start with Casey and let her take the floor. Thanks, Terry. Uh, my name is Casey Aiello. I'm uh, a C6 Asia C quad. Um, I've been in a, I've been a manual chair user for almost 22 years now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, from a snowboarding accident way back in the day. And um, so I have had multiple um, occasions on which I have um, suffered and made it through AD. Um, you know, really early on in my injury, um, I feel like they were way more intense and way more frequent. It was really just kind of my body screaming at me for, hey, pay attention to me, even though you can't feel me normally, sort of. Um, and, you know, one of those uh, early on uh, experiences that I had was it was very terrifying actually and um, it had to do with my bladder so uh, you know one morning I got up I changed my I was using an indwelling catheter at the time so I changed my indwelling catheter changed my bag headed off to school and you know I just all of a sudden started getting you know flush and red in my face I get goosebumps on my arms um, Oddly enough, when I get really bad uh, dysreflexia, my hearing kind of starts to go away. So um, you could be talking to me right in front of me, but it would sound like you were in the other room. It is just the wildest, weirdest thing. So um, I headed to the bathroom, you know, trying to check my equipment, make sure my catheter is not kinked. And, um, you know, I look at my bag and there, nothing's draining into my bag. And I was like, well, what's going on? This is a brand new bag. Um, kind of started freaking out a bit and I made a call to my roommate and she was able to uh, quickly rush home, grab an extra leg bag for me and bring it to me at the school. Um, I realized that it just wasn't uh, draining. So I took the bag off and just kind of um, drained my catheter into the toilet. And it was just like that immediate sense of relief. Like it was just um, so scary just having a simple thing like my leg bag not working and pee not draining into it. So um, that was a huge eye opener. You know, first of all, hey, why aren't you carrying extra supplies with you? Um, so I always have a backpack now and I don't all I don't actually just carry extra leg bags. You know, I'll carry an extra catheter or um, a syringe to inflate. I also have a Roho pump, you know, patch kit, all the other safety supplies that I need because I've had weird situations like that. Um, that. That was probably one of more one of the more terrifying ones. I can honestly think of a handful of other ones, but they're mostly um, bladder related. Uh, I'm sure later on when we get into uh, open discussion, we can talk about other ones, but um, yeah, huge learning for me to uh, one, check my equipment. Um, so this may sound weird, but now when I change my bag, I'll actually blow into the clean bag to make sure it's fully functioning. Um, and I always carry a, few, carry a few in my backpack anyways, but also 
ultimately it's just really learning to listen to your body. And so many things remind me of that on a daily basis. Um, you know, I'm, I'm paralyzed from partially paralyzed from my neck or my nipple lying down, but I, I feel like I'm more in tune with my, my body than I was when I was an able-bodied person, if that makes any sense. Um, I, uh, I'll cut it off there. I'm going to pass it on to our next peer and hope to have some questions later on. Yeah, well, and just quickly before I go into the next peer, I get uh, Rebecca's thoughts on your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Casey, that's a great example of um, not only an AD episode, but also just, you know, how quickly um, you can troubleshoot things, right? And once you find the cause, um, that relief is usually pretty instant. And uh, yeah, just your description there of it was having emergency supplies on hand now, like that's that's really important. So it's a good one. All right, Rob, you take the floor. Thanks, Terry, and thanks, Casey, for sharing. Um, as Terry said in the introduction, my name is Rob McIsaac. I am a uh, client services coordinator as well as the peer coordinator for um, Northern Alberta for Spinal Cord Injury Al Alberta. Um, registered social worker and I am a C4 Asia C incomplete quadriplegic now of 17 years. So manual wheelchair user as well, much like Casey. Um, I have um, lots of experiences with autonomic dysreflexia in those years just because of uh, changes in my body and difference. So one of the quick points I want to start with was very early on into injury. Um, I experienced a severe case of AD while I was actually in the rehab while I was there, um, which was good and bad because one, the staff was there. They knew what was going on, very experienced staff on the unit. And also my parents were there. So at the time, my parents were also my full-time caregivers. Since then, I'm 100% I'm um, independent, uh, you know, for many years now. But to have that experience was huge. Um, to know, like, I've heard, I had heard so much about autonomic dysreflexia and just to be mindful of it. And of course, you know, went through the first few things, checked the body, sat up, you know, and I've all, I often tell people, like, try to explain that experience, a severe case of uh, autonomic dysreflexia is think of the worst migraine you have ever had in your life and multiply that by 10, if not more, you know, where the head is pounding so hard vision. I, I've been to the point where my vision was almost gone. And as Casey said before, hearing was virtually non-existent. So it was going through those steps of, okay, pressure, bowel, bladder, you know, and for me, through all the 17 years, 97% of the time, it's my bladder. I've had multiple issues with it over the years, but that's just figuring out what's going to work for me. Bodies change. And remember, some of these stories are very um, um, individualized, but also still have the similar outcomes, right, of autonomic dys if you're um, in that range to experience autonomic dysreflexia. Um, so yeah, that was that one, that time, and we didn't think I uh, it was my bladder because I had just cath probably about thirty minutes prior to when I experienced this AD. So that's why we did the skin and bowel first. But then just because of the heck of it and it wasn't being relieved, put another cath in because at the time I was doing intermittent cathing. Sure enough, I filled that freaking tray, so it was like an instant relief, like whew, gone. And at that time, I did experience, you know, the goosebumps, the sweats, uh, severe th throbbing in my head, all kinds of stuff. But now, going forward, you know, I've had one of one of the other experiences I had was with skin, which doesn't happen very often. Like, you know, I, I've been in some pretty compromised situations before where I shouldn't have been and fell out of my chair and halfway under a bed with my legs all twisted up. Never caused AD. Just like she, Re Rebecca had said that. You know, sometimes injuries, bones, things like that, where your body just being, you know, twisted up like a pretzel can cause it, right? But mine was a, a burn um, from a heated car seat, not realizing I was on a long drive, leather, heated seats, sat there, it was on the whole time, probably about four and a half hours, no idea. All of a sudden I woke up and I was like, sweat. Like, what is going on? Like, something is wrong. Never really, you know, figured it was a heated car seat. So sure enough, by this point, I got to my destination, you know, just 
when Almond Day jumped out of my jumped out of the car into my chair, and I was kind of like, "Ooh, something doesn't feel right." So sure enough, I hop in bed and kind of roll over and look. I had two second degree burns on my butt, you know, on each cheek. So I'm like, "All right, we know where this is all coming from." Every time I sat up. So that was one of being mindful, like I didn't get throbbing headaches or anything, but I just had sweats and I don't sweat. I know if I start sweating because of AD, it's bad. Like it's real bad for me. Like I, I got to get things quick, like fixed quick. Um, so, you know, there, there's that one. And again, going back, I've been able to, over the many years, be able to, like Casey said, know my body. I know my body so well that I can speak, I find I experience AD in two separate ways. I know when it's my bladder and I know when it's my bowel. There's just this different weird sensation that I get, and it might be just because I'm an incomplete injury, that I know if it's my my bowel, knock on wood, hasn't been the case, but you know, uh, many years ago, yeah, I knew what it was. I had to go, I had to go to the can, right? And take care of that. Um, I do experience it quite frequently during um, my regular bowel routine. Um, and I know why, <laughs> I know why I've seen my physician for that. So, you know, working on methods to kind of limit that, you know, and what triggers that. So it's just being, again, looking at those methods to be able to resolve it or at least lower it. It doesn't last very long. It's just there for a second and then gone. I get little tingles, um, throughout my body and that's about it. Um, there was another time as well, and I think I know I, I want to share the three of them really quick because it's, I think it's just important to know that even though you're doing intermittent gas, what led me to change up my routine is that I had partial bladder function after I was injured. So I was able to just use condom drainage and pee in a bag and calves twice a day, right? In the morning and the evening. But obviously over time, those things changed. And within one month, I was uh, rushed to emerge three times. Uh, for severe AD, like to the point that I couldn't get a cath in, nothing was working at all, um, which was absolutely terrifying, which led me to changing up my bladder management. Um, now, the one thing I do when I, when I travel or even home, if, if I get a sense of it, it's like, okay, check my bag, check my hose. And what I mean by hose is catheter tubing and stuff to make sure it's not kinked especially right where the super pubic calf comes out. I always check, make, make sure my waistband, you know, if I get that little tingle, I'm like, oh, something tied up down there. So there's that. And then if that's not the case and there's a blockage, I have what I use, I don't just change it. I use uh, the uh, IV, um, what's the, um, the little tiny syringes that people, an IV flush. So I have little packages of IV flushes small little syringes, just clean the end off an alcohol swab, stick it in the end of the cat and give it a quick shot and it clears it. Like that's one of the things I carry with me because I don't want to go through the trauma of changing that cath every time I get a weird little sensation or a small blockage because it happens. So that's what has worked the best for me. So that's it in a nutshell. I got many more stories, but I'll keep it for another day or a question period. So thanks. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Rebecca, any thoughts? Yeah, those are um, another um, great set of examples. So I think you highlighted everything. So bladder, bowel, skin. Um, and yeah, really, like I think you did a great job explaining that it's really important to listen to your body. So, you know, you're getting these little signals. Sometimes it's hard to um, know what, what's going on, but, you know, then troubleshooting or brainstorming, okay, what can be the cause of, of this AD episode? Um, the other thing you said that I found really interesting is just like how the body changes over time. And I think that's another really important thing to, to discuss. So, you know, just because when you were first injured, you might've had this one symptom or um, one issue over the years, things can change. And just to be really um, kind of mindful of that as well going forward. I, I do want to, sorry, highlight one thing off that. Thank you for reminding me, Rebecca, and thank you for your feedback. One of the things is just not in with the body changing, but it's also knowing how to deal with it uh, mentally and psychologically. Because when, it, when you're brand new, 
that anxiety or that heightened sense of, uh, oh my God, that freak out phase is there, which obviously doesn't help the blood pressure and the heart rate, right? And so I found that being able to control and relax my body and knowing what's going on and not getting uh, hyped up keeps me level-headed and not to, I guess, accentuate or I, I forget the, the good big word for that, but for it to go out of control. Cause I found that if I, if I freaked out, it's going to go nuts. Like it gets 10 times worse, but being able to stay calm, cool, and collective under that, that experience at the time, it's able, you're able to better direct your care if you need to direct it or to just figure out what's happening. So that you don't, you know, end up in a merge. So thanks. Sorry. No, thanks Rob for adding that. And we'll move on to Keisha, our, uh, our old star. You put a lot to go up for. Um, so I'm Keisha Mastrodemus, um, C5, C6, incomplete quadriplegic after a car accident with a moose. So initially, and which is in opposition to Casey, um, I started getting AD at the beginning of my accident, um, kind of even less so, and it kind of progressed uh, as my injury went on. So in the very beginning, uh, yeah, we did these little seminars right after our accident at the Glen Rose and everything. Um, but I didn't really um, understand or know the symptoms of it initially. So when I actually first got AD for the first time, I was laying in bed and I honestly thought that I was dying. I even sent like text messages out to my friends and I'm just like, oh, loved you guys so much. Sorry, I'm going out. Like I didn't really know what was going on but I was experiencing hot flashes in which now I just um, correlate it with like early menopause. Like, you know, you hear people say like going through these hot flashes and whatever. So that's kind of what happens is I get super, super hot, super flushed. And um, yeah, uh, turns out my bladder was just like Rob was super, super full. Um, and what I found that um, when you go from being in your wheelchair to laying down in a bed, all the water kind of drains from your feet and goes into your bladder. So you could not even drink hours, hours before your bed, but as soon as you lay down, it comes. So as um, uh, life progressed and all that, I started realizing, and like you guys said, knowing your body and knowing the signs. So with bowels and bladder, where um, I would get the tingles, I would get the hot flashes, the sweating a little bit and all this, and you kind of get a little bit of um, a warning. So before I got my colostomy bag, um, right before I was about to shit my pants, I would get like a little bit of a uh, hot flash. Let's go with that. And at that point I could be like, okay, damn, I got to get out of the classroom. I got to get out of work. I got to get out of here, which whatever saving grace, honestly, in those moments. Um, and yeah, as soon as you, um, I drained my catheter or cleaned up my crap, whatever, um, the hot. ED went away. So, um, I kind of, those weren't really traumatizing for me. They weren't scary. They were kind of just, yes, this sucks, but we dealt with it. Um, honestly, about a couple of months ago when I was back in Grand Prairie, this was the most terrifying one for me. And, um, so I have the super pubic now and it was, I was just having issues with UTIs, um, it getting blocked, clogged, everything. So at one point we had taken out the super pubic. I already had EMS at my house and everything. And I was telling them because the super pubic, um, it literally grows over in seconds. So I was telling them, you need to push, push, push this into um, my bladder or it's not going to go in. And I need to drain that pee. And at this point I'm sweating. I am starting to get a headache. I am going through those hot flashes. I'm spasming like crazy. And they just weren't listening to me. So they were taking my blood pressure. And I told them initially, I was like, okay, I'm regularly 80, like 80 is my baseline. When they took the, uh, my blood pressure, I was at 155. And the dude, the damn paramedic was just like, oh, that's normal. That's normal. You don't need to be afraid. And I was like, listen, buddy, that is not normal. I have heard of this stuff. I've never gone through this. And as Rob was saying, yes, anxiety gets the best of you in those moments. So at this point, again, I think I'm dying. And I was just like, 100%. This is literally the only thing I can say. Um, yes, I was a bitch to him. And I was like yelling at him. I was like, buddy, like, 
I don't care what you have to do. This is not normal. I need to go to the hospital. And I was not rational at all. And I was, I was being rude, but they think that it's normal that your blood pressure is 155. So yes, they got me into, uh, the ambulance, got me to the hospital and, uh, yes, they sat me up and everything. And my blood pressure went down. And after that, I was able to like, I apologize for my behavior. And I said, so we were able to have a conversation after that. And he was like, oh crap. Like I, I didn't know that that was not normal. And so, yeah, you have to come down from that anxiety and meet on a mutual basis to have that conversation and understand and all that. So yeah, I'm excited for all of this uh, new protocol coming out where they don't, they don't, uh, you know what I mean? That they realize that this is actually a medical emergency and all of that. And I'm pretty sure that that was, that was my stuff. Thanks, thanks Keisha. You're your stories are always some of the best and they always, uh, they're very detailed. Uh, Rebecca, I'll let you have a thought on that. Yeah, I would second that, Terry. Thank you, Keisha. That was a more amazing descriptions of how AD can look. Um, yeah, one really important thing that you said that I would like to repeat is just knowing your baseline blood pressure and knowing that even if blood pressure can look quote unquote normal, um, that it could still be a medical emergency. And yeah, I think this is a nice segue into hearing about the, the new wallet card. Oh yeah. So I will share the screen again and uh, move it on back to Rob and Casey who have been part of this new protocols that the uh, Alberta Health Services have been making. Sorry. All right, Rob. Sorry, I was trying to get off mute. Um, Terry, wasn't there uh, slides for this you have there? There we go. All right, cool. So uh, Casey, Casey is actually involved on the working group side of, um, of, of these projects that have been coming up. And I've been involved um, from, the, from collaborating with Spinal Cord Injury Alberta with uh, what's called the uh, NRVSCN, which is the Neuro Rehabilitation and Vision Strategic Clinical Network. So the big thing about it is um, overviewing project is the standardization of care for patients with a spinal cord injury. Um, so, you know, we're working with changing the practices and decreasing practice variation. And that's with uh, AHS, Allied Health, um, primary care networks and, and, and such. Um, and improve the patient and family experience. You know, this again, this is just a bit of the background on it of where the ADE stuff came from. Um, so out of working, from my understanding, from out of the working with the, the NRV SCN has been doing that one of the things came up was standardization of protocols for autonomic dysreflexia. As Rebecca had said earlier, that most times uh, it, you may have to advocate and just from Keisha's story alone of being like, that just says that there, there's a need for more education to be put out there um, on autonomic dysreflexia for healthcare professionals. Obviously it's good to have that information for family, loved ones, caregivers and such as well. So with the protocols, um, they're, they're for AHS staff to use, but they're also accessible externally for anybody that, you know, wants to know what's involved in that, right? So that the family members know, or any, a new injury knows that, hey, this is a key piece of um, information to know, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit of where it came from. Obviously, I, the part that I was involved in was just, um, for one, sharing my story to the NRVSCN team and having other individuals from the community to be involved and share their experiences and their stories, like Keisha's story about going to with EMS, some individuals going to emerge and, you know, sitting there and kind of having staff or triage scratch their heads and not be aware of, of AD. It's like, I heard a little bits and pieces of it in school, but not really knowing that it is a med medical emergency and you need to be, uh, you're a high, high acuity, right, to be seen and get in to see somebody to get, get, shit in some cases figured out so that's where that's at and i will pass it to casey a little bit 
Yeah, Terry, I'll get you go to the next slide, please. So um, here were some of the concerns that were expressed by those living with uh, spinal cord injuries. Um, you know, like Keisha's stories and probably a few of us in the, the Zoom room here um, have expressed to healthcare, some health, healthcare professionals who aren't very well versed in what autonomic dysreflexia is, just sort of the dangers and just really how frightening it is to go through it simply because of you know, problems with their bladder, bowel, or skin. So um, it's really a really neat thing has actually come out of um, all of our voices being elevated and um, the SCN that is um, prior to prioritizing this standardization of care um, is that you know one of our a few of our uh, clinicians were actually able to present to uh, EMS and uh, the emergency department and just really make them hyper aware of this. And so it is on their computer system and um, you know, realizing that that elevated blood pressure is actually a serious issue. Uh, so even just moving on from that, so again, like this, this is just gonna segue into the next slide, but with, um, with this stuff being presented, it's it's showing the need for that further education, even though it's not not completely there. And as for the uh, protocols, um, like Casey was saying, where they're in the computer system, well, they went they they have actually gone live as of September fifteenth, so they can be found on My Health Alberta um, when or when you present at an ER or EMS, they can. Um, bring it up, right, to know that this is the procedure that they need to follow. Um, and again, when, when you look at delayed care, one of the delayed care results can be, um, in, I, I said, sorry, I just realized I said it already, but being assigned, assigned an incorrect lower triage score. So when you're assigned the triage score, it's kind of like your IQ, acuity, right, of when you get in. If you're presenting with just a common cold, obviously, that freaking wait time is going to be forever in the emergency department. Or when you're going in with AD, it's like, no, this is not my normal blood pressure, like Keisha was saying, that our, an individual with a, a, a T6 and above injury, and I'm actually not sure about below that either. I just know that T6 and above, our blood pressure is always low, right? So comparing that to an able-bodied individual is just not feasible. It's just not the same at all, right? So, so Terry, we can move on. Cool, Terry. And I might get you to enlarge the screen if possible. Or, so it's pretty big. Yeah. Sorry. That's so. Um, being that I work with a, just I'm involved in the. Can I get that link. Oh, just make sure. Themselves on mute if they're not presenting, please. Um, so this is what this is the card that um, has been put out by AHS. It's a provincial wide um, card, and we work with SEI Alberta to, to make this happen. And as you can see on there, there's a spell for your name. Um, it's very important for you to actually know your baseline blood pressure and level of injury. And, you know, basically everything that you need to know about AD is on there. And if you look on the, which will be the back side of the card uh, where you see that uh, QR code, um, if you scan that, uh, whether you're a family, um, a friend, a partner, um, or um, a healthcare, healthcare, healthcare worker, you will be taken to the AD protocol. Um, and basically what needs to be done for a person experiencing autonomic dys dysreflexia. Again, Rob said this went live uh, September 15th, so um, anybody can see what the protocol is, but there, now everybody sort of on, as a patient um, or family and healthcare prefer, health, well, healthcare worker are on the same page about autonomic dysreflexia and what to do. And uh, Rob, I'll let you finish up here. Sorry, I was actually looking for the uh, 
link to share in the chat box because I heard it mentioned about where to get the link. Um, so we, there we go. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Keisha, for anybody looking to look at it. So again, AD card brochure, we're, 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 that's in the finalization. So it hasn't gone out into public yet. And the reason, it, one of the reasons it came about is that the, there, there has been a couple different ones. So this has input from not just EMS, but also from physicians and physiatrists as well, like Rebecca, uh, Dr. Kane from the Glen Rose. So a lot of people had a lot of input to put into it um, and a lot of work obviously around the time to be done to be able for individuals to have this. Um, one of the things too is when, you when you're able to present it, you're able to scan the QR code and it takes that healthcare professional directly to the protocols, um, which is good, which is good. I mean, obviously in the, again, having that baseline. Um, and yeah, so the, the, when, when it does go live, um, it's gonna be accessible. Uh, not yet, there, I'll answer that actually right now since I see a pop-up. So it's not live yet. There is going to be a, an external link for people to be able to access it. We will have the link on our website, Spinal Cord Injury Alberta, that will direct you directly to My Health Alberta, where it, you will be able to access it and download it there and go from there. So uh, I believe it's going to be, come December, it's going to be uh, My Health Alberta is where it's going to be accessible from um, to actually get. So this is great, great news that one of the things um, Casey had said that a lot of voices have been heard from the individuals accessing care for this stuff. Um, a lot of different stories shared. So, I mean, it was really good to um, put those stories and voices to work and show that something has been done about it. And yeah, we'll go from there. So. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself again. Um, thank you so much for all my, our guests that were able to talk and share their stories and this exciting new news for AD in our, in our community. Um, so I believe Re Rebecca has to leave, Dr. Sharpner has to leave around one o'clock. Um, so if, if you have any questions, focus more on her, uh, uh, please we'll get them. We got about 12 minutes of her time. And uh, just quickly, I guess I'll start off the discussion. Uh, we all have uh, Haiti stories. Everybody's probably got a few. Um, my one big story that I had was uh, when I was getting my super pubic catheter put in, I was in the uh, in with the urologist um, at the, I guess not surgery, what it, their, their clinic and put in the super pubic and they noticed I had some stones in my um, in my urinary tract. So they went in to break up the stones and while they're breaking up the stones, I've never had AD issues. I never really had that bad. And all of a sudden my head just went boom. And I was, it was pounding. Luckily they already had me on a cuff because they always do that during their um, procedure. And my, I was over 200, like my blood pressure was, uh, and I thought I was going to die. And it happened to be the one day that I didn't bring so there's, you know, your emergency medication that you can take and it helps drop your blood pressure if you have any, you're in an emergency scenario. Um, but they, and they didn't have any in the room on hand, which I was told they usually do, but uh, they had changed the process and now they don't hold it. So it took about 15 minutes for them to go get medication from the pharmacy, bring it in so I could have it so that I, you know, could drop down my blood pressure. And so I was curious with these protocols and everything, this might be for Rob, Casey or Rebecca, do you know if that's gonna be something that changes in procedure rooms? Like, will they have medication on hand or something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it would be really specific to um, each procedure room, but my recommendation would be um, to always have your own medication on hand because I, you know, there's so many different procedures yeah. out there that you may be getting like um, in a dermatology office or with a GI or um, yeah. And so I think at this point, it would be hard to um, 
uh, imagine that they would all have like Captopril or whatever medication um, you've been prescribed. So um, yeah, just another case to, to have your emergency kit on you. Yeah, thank you. So the floor is open for any questions of anybody. Oh, I do see a hand up, uh, Ben Andrews. Hello, um, I'm Ben Andrews. I have a T4 paraplegic. Um, I just wanted to share my experience. Um, about 20 years ago, shortly after my accident, I had AD. And to make a long story short, I checked everything, couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And I, it manifested in chest pain and that was radiating down my arm. So I'm thinking, okay, those are the symptoms of the heart attack. So I ended up dialing 911 and going to the emergency room. And of course there was a delay there because my heart was fine. And um, finally my, my wife insisted that they do either a CAT scan or an MRI. I don't remember which now. And it turned out to be my appendicitis. So they rushed me to the operating room um, my appendix burst on the table. I went septic, came very close to dying. Um, so the moral of the story is if, if you can't figure out what's going on with your body and what's causing the AD, don't hesitate to call 911. Um, that's very important because if I had waited probably another 30 minutes or an hour, I probably would have died. Um, and obviously most people, you know, appendicitis is fairly routine. You go in because your stomach's hurting, they press on it, they realize what you have, and it's pretty simple. But for us, it's not, obviously. So I just wanted to share that. No, thank you for your story. I, I'm just glad there's a moral to your story and not just a sad ending. So thank you, Ben. Uh, I see another hand. Uh, there's two hands up. Ben or Eric had his hand up first, and then I'll go to you, Vance. Or Eric, you're muted. Maybe I'll go to Vance first and I'll go to Eric once you. Oh, sorry. I figured out how to unmute. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to share a quick story with me. And I'm really glad that um, protocols are cha being changed with AHS because I was in the hospital. Uh, I, don't get a, I don't get AD very often, uh, but I was in the hospital uh, recently. And, um, you know, I insisted they put me on an airbed. Um, but I was getting AD from their airbed because the hospital airbeds have a really thick rubber uh, surface on them. And um, there was wrinkles in this rubber, which was causing my AD. And I asked the nurse if she could check my blood pressure like every 15, 20 minutes. And uh, she basically said, not going to happen every six hours. Is, was, you know, so basically, my, I called my partner. He came in and he rolled me. And I was basically sitting on a, a really thick piece of rubber. Uh, from the hospital airbed. So the next time I went to the hospital, I got permission to bring my own air mattress. So that's another thing that can we can do as well as bring our own airbeds with us. Well, good to know that definitely uh, when you're getting out of your element and out of your experienced uh, house and things, you know, you, you have to advocate. Uh, Vance. Thanks, Terry. Um, I really enjoyed this. And and hearing people's story very much um, early on with respect to bladder and bowel mirrored my experience. I've been, 1978 was when I had a surfing accident and broke my neck at C7 and have been in a manual wheelchair since then. Uh, but it's, so it's, it's been interesting, a, a recent journey I've gone on, uh, I'm about to approach 70 now. And in the last three and a half years, things have really changed for me. And um, I think I would have liked the opportunity to participate in this three and a half years ago because I was dealing with these episodes of perspiration. And like many of you, I never perspire uh, ever since my accident, unless I have a bladder infection or I had a pressure sore or something of that sort. And I was just having these episodes of uh, perspiration and not knowing what they were. And this went on for quite some time. And... Um, and then we discovered I had what was called Charcot spine syndrome, which is a condition where your vertebrae in your spine, and it's something that uh, people T5 and above or T6, I think Rebecca could probably um, share this, but it happens with people T5 and above, it can happen. And it's a disintegration of vertebrae. Uh, and I was having that happen at, at uh, T11 and T12. 
Uh, and we didn't know that for about four months. Um, you know, we were trying to deal with all sorts of other issues around th those episodes of perspiration. Uh, my bowel function had was being interrupted because of what was going on in my spine. And then we discovered what it was. And I went in and I had an operation and had rods put in, which has created some other issues uh, for me. But uh, in, in just recently, I've been dealing with the situation, and Casey mentioned this as well, is, is I just had a blood pressure above 150. And I'm dealing with a situation in my left hip. And uh, it's called femoral head um, vascular necrosis, I think. And I, you know, if I had normal sensation, I would be feeling a lot of pain and I'm not now. And, uh, you know, since this started to happen, I've been noticing this elevation in, um, in, in my blood pressure. And I just did it yesterday. And that's why uh, Casey's 150 resonated with me because for the first time ever, I was over 150 and I'm normally, you know, 90 or, you know, low hundreds. And, um, and then I'm scheduled to go in to see a, a hip surgeon but it's out for three months now. And uh, just because of the waiting times. And so I'm going to be monitoring my um, monitoring my blood pressure here. And if it starts to elevate or continue at this level, then maybe I'll, I'll be asking, um, you know, that consideration be given to address this a, a little earlier. I've got some other complications going on, but I would urge anyone who's been 10 or 15 years post injury T5 and above you know, maybe you get that x-ray, maybe you get that CAT scan on your spine just to sort of see if there's anything going on. Uh, because that's just, you know, created a right turn in my life and the quality of the life I've been living uh, as a result of that. And, uh, and I, I just wish I would have appreciated a little more that the AD that I was experiencing, you know, you go through, is it bowel, is it bladder, is it a pressure sore? But then you've got to continue your investigation because if we had been on top of that a little more, um, we might have discovered the issue earlier before it became a real serious problem on, on the spine issue. But this was a terrific presentation. It's nice to see that you're doing these cards. I think they're really helpful. I know they do that in British Columbia as well. And because um, I just happen to be out here in British Columbia right now on the coast. And uh, I think they'll be of tremendous benefit because not everyone appreciates fully, you know, um, the significance and the potential uh, how lethal can be with AD. So um, I just wanted to share that experience. Oh, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll let Rebecca speak on that before uh, she has to go. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Um, yeah, so a couple of these examples now really, really show the importance that once you've kind of gone through those first three steps, so it's not bladder, it's not bowel, it's not skin, then you really have to um, cast a much wider net. And sometimes that involves, you know, blood work, which might be non-specific, but in the case of say appendicitis, you might say, Hey, there's a white count. Hmm, this is very unusual. Let's go looking for more. Or, um, in your case, um, Vance, I mean, it's tough. Like yep. Charcot joint is pretty rare, but you need to keep looking until you kind of find that answer. Right. So you're right. Like, um, an x-ray probably would have helped to pick up some subtle signs and a CT scan would have really shown that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in these cases, um, if it's not one of the more straightforward cases, you have to, you have to keep looking. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen again. And I was just going to get you guys while we have you is to do a quick poll. It's just a 30 second poll for you to answer some questions. Uh, I'm kind of putting Joanne on the spot, but she's got it. And uh, so we'll do this and then we'll come back to our discussion. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca. And just a quick reminder before we go back to the discussion uh, that this will, you can always find us on all our social media platforms. So Spinal Cord and Roberta, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I've, we put all of these webinars, we've taped them and they'll be up on our YouTube channel. So please go to our YouTube channel and check out if you want, are interested in any, in any of our previous uh, webinars, as well as any other inf informative videos. And uh, I normally do a uh, post peer chat, but because of Thanksgiving, this month has kind of uh, been affected, um, but I do a peer chat later in the month. So keep an eye out on our 
on our social media things and we can talk about AD if you want. Uh, usually my peer chats are a little um, more whatever you guys want to talk about, but uh, we can bring that up. And if you have any additional questions or comments, please email me at terrytanova at spinalcordinjury.ci-ab.ca. So, yeah, uh, Ben, I see you still have a hand up. Do you uh, have another question or thought, or you just forgot to take it down? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do not have a question. I didn't realize I had to take it down. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, anybody? Any, Terry, anybody? I wanted to uh, share a little a little snippet because Brandis, her comment in the chat box um, jumped out to me because it's one of the things I forgot to discuss. So I've had a few different procedures, whether it's bladder Botox or having the super pubic cath done or many years ago, having a very large calcium stone develop in my bladder. And th those two of those procedures were done back in Nova Scotia. So I don't have a I don't have the most experience with dealing with AHS and going to emergency or having that experience like uh, Casey or Keisha or anybody has. Um, so I, I can't really speak that only to, you know, what I've heard. But anyway, one of the things that they've always done for me when I've gone, I've been impressed too, Brandis, is that the anesthesiologist would always ask about an epidural. Um, and every time I've had a procedure because it blocks the AD effects right? For when you're having that procedure below, below the level of injury. So for me to have that bladder Botox done or whatever, to go, go up to your urethra, heebie-jeebies, but to block that. So obviously I don't, you know, go all crazy and autonomic AD sets in or when I went in to blast the calcium stone, right? Like that was probably 10, 12 years ago that that was done. And even then to be impressed by the fact that it's like, do you experience this? So in terms of the protocols, it's more of a, uh, right now it's more to educate the frontline staff, right? So that way you can get in to be seen quicker and then it's all noted so that they know to get you in there. But yeah, I just wanted to share that little bit about the uh, epidural stuff and anesthesiologist stuff, so. That's an, int that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, Brandis raised that about anesthetist and when I had my spine surgery two and a half years ago to insert the rods, uh, I had a huge episode of this and what was to be a three hour operation ended up being six and a half. And I became, you know, it was a question whether or not I was gonna come out of it. And, uh, and it was nice that they kept a very good record because when I went into subsequent surgery uh, at uh, the Rocky View, they were able to access those, those records and be ready for it. And, and so it's something, Anytime you go in for an operation, I think you need to talk about uh, with your doctors and the anesthetist. Well, for sure, that definitely sounds very relevant. Uh, Casey, you have your hand up. I'll just go on the theme with the uh, anesthesiologists. But so when I was pregnant and sort of uh, creating our birth, my my birth plan. Um, I was considered high risk, obviously, because of my injury, but um, my idea of having a, a, a midwife and a doula and, you know, birthing in a tub was all of a sudden just, sorry, that's, that's not happening. Um, you are very high risk and this could, you know, labor could actually throw you into like um, a serious battle of AD, um, so much so that I could possibly have a stroke and die. So, I did have a, um, what's the needle in your back called? Epidural. Yeah, I had an epidural. And so that sort of um, numbed the pain of the birth. And um, yeah, it was it was a weird thing, but I didn't realize that I, I couldn't have my heavy birth, but a safe birth I had. <laughs> Casey, it doesn't matter. We know what your personality. So if you didn't, weren't in a spinal cord injury, I'm pretty sure you would have been you would have been doing it while you're on a hike up a mountain or something like that, just for the heck of it. Um, <laughs> any other comments, questions? We have we can go until 1.30, so we have time. So if people have any. If I could just make a, a respond to Casey just for a moment. Uh, Casey, my son uh, and his wife, we just delivered. We just had our second grandchild and it was a home birth with midwives, birthing bath, all of that. Unfortunately, the midwives arrived two minutes after the actual birth. And 
my daughter-in-law kept telling my son, uh, will you just calm down, please? But he's now in therapy. He's doing really well. <laughs> so you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> well, well, also, and, oh, sorry. Rob? I, I was going to say for anybody present, if you even um, whatever your background is, I am also fully open to any questions, by the way, just to throw that out there. So don't hesitate because you don't know unless you ask. I think one thing we were talking when you were kind of gathering to speak about this, uh, a few of us have had experiences with AD from, from sex, but we really didn't bring that up in the discussion. We were hoping that that would come up in the post uh, webinar discussion. So hands up if you've experienced that from sex. I mean, exactly. Nope. <laughs> not, not hesitant at all. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Yeah, before before and after my injury though, Casey. So it wasn't really different. <laughs> um, well, and, but that's just the thing. Like it's it it, you know, they they had she had her list. You know, bowel, bladder, skin. You know, those are your top three. Bang, bang, bang. But you don't think about th things that can cause trauma, right? That and it's and when you use the word trauma, it's not like you know gunshot wound or cut or whatever. Like anything can be trauma. Any skin friction for Casey's sake there, but anything where your body's changing or something's happening can be traumatic to those nerves below your level of injury. And so you'll have a response. And some people have a really bad response. Some people don't have as much of a response. Um, but uh, yeah, so you, you gotta think, or if you start experience AD, you gotta remember, you know, you're either thinking ahead or you're remembering from past experiences. Uh, and that's what AD is for most of us. That's our, that's our life um, going forward. So thanks. You got to talk about sex just as much as you got to talk about bowel and bladder. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's great. Keep the KY in the, uh, in your back pocket, right? <laughs> um, one of the other things too, to point out is that uh, not just with that, but some of us, um, maybe some of us, we intentionally will use autonomic dysreflexia to boost. So when we talk about boosting, some of you here who might be para athletes or any sorts, it's, as we know, it's hard to get our heart rate up to get that adrenaline moving, but to do so, some people use it to their advantage to raise that up a little bit, you know, just to get that little extra advantage. Obviously it's very frowned upon in the sporting world and is, uh, cheating. Is, is it is cheating it is classified as cheating so when you're at a high level um say paralympic game and say for rugby's sake most of us that play rugby you know will boost maybe boost in intentionally or not right thanks keisha so much you're awesome don't shake your pants <laughs> so anyway it, it's a form of being able to get that little extra advantage and like i said it, obviously it's frowned upon casey knows what it's all about um you know so it's don't recommend it but it happens yeah it's, and it's it's tough like the fact that that's a thing you know it's like i get it and i understand why but it's kind of the same thing like you're, you're risking your life for performance Mm -hmm. um it's kind of the same that people take really bad steroids they're risking their life for performance right it's the exact same thing um so any other uh thoughts or comments or things before uh before we move on to sign off no more i'll add uh in case you make all the plans one last birthing plan uh, I have a friend who uh, had the uh, husband had to deliver on the side of the road, deliver his wife on the side of the road, five minutes from their house on their second child. And they had all the set up as well <laughs> and all the plans and everything. It just doesn't go to plan. Everything sucks. That sounds so like my son's situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dale, I saw you went off mute. You were just. Oh, nothing serious. I just, uh, is the card out there or is there any way we can get it yet? Not yet. It's not finalized. It should be. We should be fi hopefully final. Have the final uh, bits so, uh, done this week, hopefully, and then um, we'll let you keep you posted. Okay. So, 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody who joined our webinar. Again, uh, you can find us on all our social media, and this will be up on YouTube probably later this week, uh, and we'll send out the link. And something to note going forward, uh, we have your emails from you registering, and we want you guys to be part more part of our community, our webinar team, uh, to hear what it is that you guys are actually interested in. So one thing that we're planning on doing, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks here, is I'll be sending out an email with a list of eight different topics. And we wanna get you guys' top four picks. And those will be from January, uh, February, March, April, will be our four webinars, will be the top four that you guys pick. Um, because obviously we started this webinar, we started building it, picking topics we thought was important and relevant to you guys. Uh, but now we're getting to a point where we, did, we wanna hear from you and kind of see what it is that you guys would be interested in listening and hearing uh, about. So. I uh, just look forward to that email coming forward. And again, thank you so much for coming and we'll uh, talk to you guys in a month. Yes, fans. Um, Rob, I may want to give you a shout. Can you, um, do you have my email? I do not. Um, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you time to direct message Rob before we sign off. Okay, here, I'll, I'll send you mine. Okay. Seems your fingers work better than mine. For everybody else, goodbye. Have a good month. Bye. Thank <laughs> you, Larry. That was great. That's fantastic. One quad fingers. <laughs>